Kelly Gibson. I'm a senior here at Herodin. And on behalf of Herodin High School and our school's Witness Inspire Act, or VIA as we call it, um, I want to welcome you all to our, our event, The Crisis in Syria, Our Generation's Never Again Moment. Um, I would like for us to begin with a moment of silence for all of the victims in Syria of senseless violence and for the 49 people who were killed yesterday in New Zealand. Thank you. So tonight we're going to start with Anna Jelly Gibson. Anna graduated from Herodin in 2017, two years ago. Um, she has been working with the Syrian Emergency Task Force since August of this year, um, and she is going to give us a background on the Syrian Emergency Task Force and some of the work that they have been doing. Thank you for coming out tonight, and thank you to my sister, who's done an amazing job bringing you all here. <laughs> um, so I'm going to give you a little background on the Syrian Emergency Task Force. So I graduated in Harriton two years ago, so I was just sitting in these seats. Um, I took a year off of school to dedicate my time to this cause. We shouldn't have to be here today, eight years into a really horrible war where atrocities are committed today. Um, so a little bit about what Sy the Syrian Emergency Task Force does. So we have three main areas of work. So our first area of work where we dedicate most of our time and funds is to our humanitarian work. So we run a school for orphans and a women's center and two bakeries that bring bread to more than a thousand families every month in Idlib, Idlib province in Syria. It lives, as Moaz will tell you, is under increasing bombardment right now. We're very worried about our village there, but we still have our school and we have the Women's Center. And the School Women's Center are entirely funded by American communities. And with the School Women's Center, and also to other refugees and internally displaced people, we have a Letters of Hope program, which I know a lot of Harrington students were involved in it this week, I think, in advisory. The Letters of Hope program is a really incredible program that we started where people in the United States write letters to people who've been affected by the war in Syria, just saying, we haven't forgotten about you. You're loved and we're thinking about you. And our teachers at our school have actually said that these letters are as important, if not more important, than the financial support that we give them. So after tonight, you can write a letter of hope and we'd be happy to bring it into Syria. So the other area of work we do is political advocacy. So we are working on a Caesar Civilian Protection Act, which is a bill that would protect civilians in Syria. So we spend a lot of our time on Capitol Hill, working with Congress to try and advocate on behalf of the people of Syria. In fact, this Wednesday, we just had an event where both Moaz and Omar spoke, and we had the chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, ranking member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, um, a few other Congress people were speaking there and are trying to get Congress to protect the civilians and the innocent people who are affected by this war. The last area of work we do is legal work. So we are working to document, help document atrocities and prosecute war crimes. So I'm going to give it over to Moaz Mustafa, our executive director, to give you a little more information about our organization and also just a history of the war. Hi everyone, I want to start off by thanking you all so much for being here and thanking this beautiful high school. I, I went to high school in the United States when, when I moved here, I moved to the U.S. when I was nine years old and our mascot was the Rams, so it's kind of cool, I almost like a year, like almost a Go Rams, both here and in my high school. And I want to thank Siobhan and Anna um, and their wonderful family, um, Siobhan, for putting this together, it's incredible and I love just the turnout, I know it's, you know, it's uh, at night and people have work and things to do, so you all being here means, means the world to us. Um, I guess what I want to talk about is just to give some perspective over the Syria war. I'm sure many of you have heard about Syria. Um, 
on the news for the last eight years, it's become almost news wallpaper that people are dying in Syria. That somewhere far away, there are people killing other people, um, and we hear ISIS, we hear about the chemical weapons, we hear about all these different things that are happening, and it is confusing. Um, and it makes it easy to turn away, because when things are very complicated, um, and sometimes at first glance, especially because of, in a lot of ways, what's being covered in the media, what's sensational and what's not, it's hard to see who are the good guys and the bad guys, what is happening. Um, but the Syrian war has a beautiful story, and it's a story that starts with, with students younger than high school, between 9 and 13 year olds, students from a beautiful province in Syria called Dara. As a matter of fact, there's a beautiful family here that I got to meet for the first time from that province. Um, so it's a special place. And what was happening eight years ago was people in Tunisia, in Egypt, and other countries, for the first time maybe in their history, were going out to protest, not like American imperialism or um, like some foreign country or like, you know, but they were out to protest their own authoritarian governments. And they were asking for countries like the United States, a country that they saw as the people of Syria and as the people of these other countries, as, as an example of what democracy, liberty, freedom is, um, for help. And, and so when, when these Arab Spring protests began, and many of them so far have not turned out well, but Tunisia is one good example where now there is more than half their parliament is made up of women, uh, they have had uh, you know, peaceful transitions of government, they have true democracy there, this is one good story. Um, but the repression of these regimes and what happened there caused a lot of hardships. So, what was inspiring are millions of people in the streets of Tunisia calling for freedom. And these kids in Dara decided that they would write on the walls of their school some of the same slogans that they saw on TV. And one of the slogans that said beyond freedom, democracy, and so on was, it is now your turn, doctor. And that was in reference to the dictator in Damascus who was actually a trained physician. It's really hard to see how someone who's taking the oath of protecting and saving lives could could kill and destroy so many. And so when these kids went out to do this very innocently, um, they were taken by the government, they were tortured, some of them were later killed, and when the families went to ask for accountability to what happened to their children, even if their children had done something wrong, don't torture a child, the government, the, the, the law enforcement, the, the governor of the town said, go home and make new ones. And as callous as that answer is, it shows at, at how much the dictatorship in Syria cared or felt about its own citizens. And so the people protested in that province. They went out in the hundreds of thousands. At the beginning, not calling for a change in government, not calling for, but calling for reforms. Beyond that, calling for accountability to what happened to their own kids, calling for justice. And they were faced with the military, with the police forces, with the security forces. And so when this happened, there's YouTube, and there's Facebook, and there's Skype. And so people saw across Syria what was happening in Dara, and what people were dying as they were peacefully, non-violently protesting. So they came out in protests. In my opinion, a lot of these protests were there to lower the pressure on the southern province where you had the military mobilized to kill civilians. And for 9 to 12 months, by the dictator's own admission, non-violent, peaceful protests, People coming out with flowers in, in their hands and bottles of water giving it to the military saying peaceful, peaceful and the Syrian people are one. Asking for democracy which they deserve because there's unalienable rights, right? There are rights in this country that we are so blessed to have and we take for granted so much that they were going out and asking for and they deserve it. And as these protesters came out, bare chests were met with bullets and unlawful arrests into horrible dungeons where unspeakable things happen to men, women, children, and elderly. And so as these protests continued, and the world watched on with very little action, people within the military itself in Syria, some of them decided that they cannot shoot at their own civilians. They defected and formed the Free Syria Army, which at the beginning was there to help protect the protesters. But what's sad about that part is the Syrian war had transitioned now, initially from these nonviolent peaceful protests, 
into being forced into some sort of military conflict. And this continued. And as the world watched on, and I won't bore you with all the details of this long, long eight years, things got worse and worse. The Russian Air Force became the biggest supporter of the Assad regime, bombing entire areas, complete neighborhoods to the ground, targeting schools, targeting hospitals. Iran sent its militias, Hezbollah, countless Iranian-backed militias. The last uh, national security advisor said 80% of the regime's troops were these random terrorist militias that came in. And on top of that, ISIS and Al-Qaeda, which utilized the lack of action of the world and the void created in some areas to also have a foothold. And what they all have in common, ISIS, Assad, Iran, Russia, Hezbollah, Al-Qaeda, these horrible groups, is that they all understood that they had a mutual interest. And it was to destroy the democratic movement in Syria, to destroy the people of Syria. So our organization is a tiny microcosm, a small example of what that means. We lost four people, all under the age of 28. Two beheaded by ISIS, and two tortured to death by the Assad regime. And I'm telling you this, not to feel sorry for us, but I'm telling you this to remember that there is good in Syria that deserve your voice, that deserves your support in every way. And it's the people themselves. Every time I go back and forth, when I meet with someone who's lost his wife or some lady who lost her brother, either to detention or to bombs or to barrel bombs or the white phosphorus that was raining down on Idlib over the last couple of days. Um, when I do ask them, you know, why are you here? Why are you in the situation you're in? What makes me really happy to hear is the simplicity in their answer. They understand how complex Syria is. They understand that there's a bunch of different parties and there's geopolitics and competing interests. But they also understand that the heart of this revolution still lives. They tell me that we're here today because we asked for our God-given rights. And most of the time when I say, was it worth it, they'll say, we'll do it all over again. And, and that's incredibly powerful. and shows the resilience of the Syrian people. And so I could talk forever, and we're really looking more forward to your questions than really what we're all going to have to say. But I want you to hear from someone who, in my opinion, has the most powerful story, not just of the Syria war, um, but, but one of the most powerful stories that I've ever heard of, ever read about. And he is such a wonderful, wonderful person, full of energy, full of hope, despite the most horrendous odds that you guys can imagine. And so I really can't give him a proper introduction because of how much respect and admiration I have for him. And so I'll let him sort of talk to you himself. So thank you for listening and thank you for being here. And Omar. Today I'm working at a business company called, it's an amazing company, BCG, Boston Consulting Group based in Stockholm. And I used to eat the lunch with my colleagues there, but before we get to be good colleagues, we used to sit to eat lunch together. And people in this company, like a lot of doctors and engineers sitting there talking about machines, how the world works, and how it works, and how to be good management consultants, and sometimes it's kind of boring stuff if you're not really interested. And people use, if you're new, ask you about your background, which means your education. So people start, somebody saying I'm an engineer, I'm a civil engineer, this man is a doctor and uh, she is an engineer as well, and you have engineer there, and engineer there. And always it come to me, and your turn over, who are you? I say I have a general education, bachelor in general education. Interesting, people say, yeah, from which university? Yeah, it's Sydney University. Oh, good. Where is it? It's in Syria. Uh huh. Can you explain what, what this general education is? I say, yes, yeah, like a bit of math, and you study physics, and you study some uh, medical and use medicines, and you study some um, law, some everything. Like, think of everything you study in this university. Oh, interesting. Some people was answering, yeah, really interesting. I heard about something like that in the US. 
I said, no, it's not in the US. You know, in Syria, we have the best university on earth. I said, wow, what is called Sayyidnaya? Okay, so people take, because never heard about this, I say, top ranking that university, you know, you're talking about Harvard and Sayyidnaya, and people will say, wow, when I Google it, maybe when I play, study there, or you do your master there. So people Google that and get some results. Like spray weed results, you, like, you get some pictures of dead bodies. And they will say, there is no result, there is not. Can you spell it? And they say, yeah, save Naya. And we say the letters for that, and we will Google it again. And they just get pictures of dead bodies in the very dark building. It feels like it's very scary. And we will show them, are you sure? Yes, it's the university where I was in three years. People don't understand. And they ask me, be clear, Omar. I say, yeah, my university was a prison. You know, people, engineer, 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 doctor, engineer, 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 prisoner. Like, very weird people think, wow, we are always a criminal here. <laughs> Some one of us gonna die or something. I love this company, I love my work. I'm gonna explain what this university is. I live in Sweden, and why in Sweden? I'm 23 years old. I moved to Sweden because I was sick. My sickness was TBC, tuberculosis, which was like really hard. I was coughing blood in my last days. And I was 75 pounds. Can you run to me, Bridget? Take my So when I was 20 years old, I was as heavy as you. I was 20 years old. And my, my young brother, you can run back. Oh. And my younger brother, Olive, who was 10 years old, was like 80 pounds or more. So I was 20, he was 10, he was heavier than me. The reason was being in prison. Why I was in prison? was because of the revolution in Syria. How the revolution started, now let's talk about that, but it was because of the children, or thanks to children. Some children in school wrote in that, well, Shaheed Kedori Doctor, which means it's your, your term, Doctor. The Doctor is our president. He has, he has a Doctor, uh, I Doctor. And the children wrote that, the wall and the security, the intelligence security attack the school. And there was this children and killed the children. And as a father or as a brother or as a sister or as a friend, what do you want to say when someone kills your best friend or your son or your daughter? People gonna react, at least say no, stop. That's unacceptable. But people People knew that the government is like crazy, they can, they can kill everyone. So they made the, the latest reaction they can do. Just get out of the street, say stop, we want our, we want our children back. Why you do that? Stop. For me, I was a child at that time. I was 15 years old. And I had no idea what freedom means. And why people was demonstrating? I had no idea why children was in prison. I thought children was like criminal. They did something wrong. Because I always learned that school police was good people. And I saw that on TV. So it was like kind of difficult to understand why there was this children, even though I wrote that in the wall. I don't have that, that complete picture in my head. I had a really, really hard father. My father was really hard. So, if I am outside the home when the sun go down, I'm gonna have a lecture with my father. So, come home, open the door, my father is waiting there. <laughs> uh, he's sitting there. Over, come. And I should stand like that in front of my father. I need to go to the restroom. Absolutely not. And he had like really long lectures, like two hours. <laughs> you can't move. 
You can't enroll me. It's like really hard because my father was an officer. And the officer, he should be like really strong man and angry man the whole time. So I was standing in front of my old father like many hours every day because I always want to do something that was not allowed. I want to do, to do something different from other people. So my father always had a picture of me and I get some pants sometimes. Habits because I was kind of stupid. But I like being stupid at that time. I want to learn about everything. Yeah, go down, fight with my neighbor sometimes. I love that neighbor and I do something else. I want to do things. I was in the first demonstration in my city. Eight years ago. And I love to see a lot of people together. It was 30, 40,000 people together. Look, it's amazing to see you all here. It was a lot of people at that time. And Omar, I love seeing a lot of people. You know, I want to meet every single one. I was really happy to see people. So we're going to this demonstration, standing with people. They say something, freedom, say freedom, which means in, in Arabic, we say, hurry, hurry, hurry. I feel really good. Don't understand, but feel good. <laughs> and something was happening on the other side. There's a lot of police coming and intelligence service coming and an officer standing in front of these people. And like, it feels like thousands of soldiers and a lot of people demonstrating. Everyone is looking at the police. I was not scared at that time. Like, the police, they here to protect us. <laughs> feels good. It became kind of silence everywhere. No one is talking. Everyone is looking at the police. I could hear the officer was like 100 meters far away from me saying, Miles, be silent now. Yeah, and I could hear the officers saying something there. It was saying, load, and you could hear all the guns. All the guns together. Oh, it's getting excited. I was looking like guns and aim. I felt that the gun was like going to, to my eyes. And if you tried that before, it's like, it's not easy. Even if you can't trust these people, they're not gonna kill you. It's not easy to see the weapons like in front of your head. And the officer said, shoot! It was not like a TV game or... For the first day in my life, when I saw dead body, it was different. It was my best friend, dying next to me, but I could not move to try to help her. The other side was my cousin. It's blood everywhere. People just dying. I thought I was dreaming or something similar. I don't understand what's happening right now. Like blood everywhere, and people is like happy to shoot us. This police is happy to shoot us. I don't understand. And like was standing in my place, can't move. Can't, can't look at, at them anymore, just standing like that. <laughs> and they came, and the security arrested me and took me to prison for two days. Two days in prison was enough to educate me to know how important the revolution is in Syria. Why we should be straight, why we should go out to street to say stop to our regime, to the security and the intelligence service who kill people. They tortured me in prison with electricity shock or with starvation. We get no enough food or the first two days without food. I get out of prison for two days because all the women in my village demonstrated and did something. On the street, so the security was forced to just release us.
get out of prison full of energy, want to do more, want to do something you know what that means, to get back and start menstruating. And I remember that feeling when I was in the first demonstration after prison, I was just saying freedom and I felt my heart is like flying and I said, freedom, freedom, fly, say that from my heart, extremely happy, that's the right thing, I'm doing something good. I'm gonna stop this system that kills children and tortures children. But I was a high school student going to school. I want to be an engineer, to be honest. My father wanted to be an engineer, wanted me to be an engineer at that time. So I was forced to be an engineer, studying many hours every day. Our way to the school was crossing the shift point where the police asked me for my ID card and I showed the ID card and they read, my name is Umar. It's a big problem to have this name because the group who had the power in Syria, we call them Alawi. And these people, there was a leader for 1,300 years ago who killed many of this group. His name was Umar. And now my name is Umar. So they was punishing me only for, because of this leader for thousand years ago. It was always a problem. I give the ID card, they arrest me, end up in prison two, three days. My father and officer pay some money and say, it's my son, he is good, get me out of prison. And they arrest me the last time when I was 17 years old. I was arrested seven different times. But that time was very different. I used to wait for my father to come to prison and just take me out. So I tried to continue being strong. When they hit me, asked me, how many officers have you killed? I didn't say they killed anyone because I did not. But they want to force me to say I killed people, so I stay in prison for a long time. And force me to say I had weapons, stay in prison for a long time. But I don't say that for the first week. But it's a hard week. Wait a hard week for a minor in prison. Even when you sit down in the, in the chair, you don't have enough space. More than that. It's everything we got in prison, this square, nothing else. You sit down for hours and stand up in four hours. There is a prisoner in front of you gonna change with you because we don't have enough space. There is a lot of prisoners, political prisoners. We tried to adapt to the situation, but it was difficult. After two weeks, I start to lose the hope that the hope that my father is coming to release me. And I start to say that I killed people because I could not continue with that horrible torture. I lose at that time I lose my fingernails. They took out them. And I could not look at my, my hands. I do not want I do not want to see that. It looks so bad, and I was still a child, so I was thinking, and they just cut all my hair. So I was thinking, when I was in my 40 centimeters in this small square, I was thinking, if I get out of prison now, I'm not handsome as before. Wow, the girl I liked, not gonna like me without her, or like to look very handsome as before. Gonna be horrible. I'm not the best student now because I missed weeks of studying. There's people better than me in school right now. I was scared. I was not sure if I want to be released or not. If I get out, I'm bad student. My father gonna be angry. 
because I'm not going to be an engineer if I'm a bad student. And don't know what to do. Still waiting to present. Yeah, want to be out maybe. But there is a notion you can skip the school because you can't go to a school always if you have a revolution because it's gonna be war and people are killed in the streets. In prison, you get good people around you. The good thing with being a young person in prison is all other old people focus on you. So I was 17 years old and this person, 50, 60, 70, and this person, 30, all these people older than you, all these people has had more experience. They know more about life. They have like high level, they highly educated people. So you sit down. We were not allowed to speak in prison. So in three years in prison, I never, never heard my voice in three years. One time, they took me to the judge. I was really excited. Not to go to the court of the judge to be released later, no. But I always want to be a strong, big man. So I want to have this voice. So I took me to the court, I was waiting the judge to ask me questions so I can answer, so I can hear my voice in the two and a half years. I was really excited, forgot all the torture, all the pain, the starvation, everything. I was thinking, yeah, I'm gonna hear my voice now. I just kept standing in front of the court. I had a, a blindfolder, could not see anyone. But she asked me, how many have you killed? I was almost saying no one, but I could not. Because I used to whisper in three, two and a half years. So I whispered, say, no one. And he said, good. It was everything. I could not hear my voice. They were transferring me back to the same prison. And my friends in prison, I, when I left the room, it was 34, 35 people. Only one day when I came back, there was seven. A lot of people died because of torture. When I get back to this cell, people come to me and say, oh, I was your voice. <laughs> We're really excited to hear about my voice. Do you feel you're a man now? You're strong now? It was one of the times that I don't choose to cry, but at that time, I was almost crying. I could not use this chance to hear my voice. For me, was really hot. To be hungry, everyone been hungry before. Maybe two hours, three hours, one day, two days without food. Everyone has experience. And I had experience, but especially experience in prison, I was really hungry. Because we get like a bit of bread or half of potatoes for one day and a glass of water. Before we talk about hunger and starvation, let's talk about the shower. Because you don't have a shower every day. The first time I had a shower was in one year. To be honest, 11 months, 22 days. And it was like, I was creative at that time. We didn't go to the shower. You save your water to take a shower. So I decided to do not drink tomorrow, so I can use my glass to shower. I was thirsty, I want to drink, but no, I'm going to shower today. So you take this glass, you wash, it's been washing, all your body, it's been washing, and you still have water. Really good shower, and you feel clean. Psychologically, it was well felt really clean, and still had a bit of water to drink. So you could use my water and mix it. 
for my first shower. Then the last year we had a special, we get to go out to shower, but no, not much people want to go out because the shower was blood shower. You get in 50 people, you go back 10. People die. They kill people in the shower. They make that as blood showers, people just die. My dream in prison was to eat once, be full, and die. Nothing else. The past to dream. Because when you are hungry, you don't think about freedom or being released. No. You think about the food and to eat. I decided to eat once. So I used every day, two months, to eat half my food, which is little food, and give, give, give the other half to someone else in the room. And the day after, give this other half to someone else, and someone else, and someone else. And all these people, in exchange, should pay me back after two months. It was a Friday. Right, it came after two months. All these people I gave in two months should pay me back today. It was my dream day when I was sitting in the corner and people just coming and say, Omar, it's your bread. Omar, it's your bread. Omar, it's your food. Omar, it's water. I gave some water as well because I wanna drink a lot of water at that day. I had decided, I decided to have a shower too. So I said more water, I gave water to food, and food, so get shower and get food and have an amazing day, the dream day. And I like that the food's coming, the food's coming, like it felt like they have a lot of food. It was only like this. But it felt like in my heart a lot of food, so I was really happy to have it. So we're just collecting food next to me. And we're, when you're so hungry, you love to look at the food before you eat. So I put all this food next to me. I was looking at it for a long time and I start to have plans. Do you think, what do you think is Donald Trump doing right now? Thinking about his money. I was gonna have spend money with that and buy this hotel and buy this car and buy this stuff. The same thing I had. I was thinking about what are we gonna do with all this food? With all this food, I'm gonna eat half this food and I'm gonna um, give it to some people who's great people helping me the whole time. I'm gonna sell some food, I'm gonna invest again and give some people some of my food again. While I was thinking about that, I felt like I'm gonna lose all my food and investment again. I'm not gonna eat. What, what about my dream day? Like, so just have some other ideas to give, give food to other people or sell food, get back potatoes and give some other thing to other people, have a shower, all this stuff. Then I said, no, I'm gonna eat. Collected this food. I want to have some dreams. So I put my hand. I use, as I used to sit like that, I had amazing dreams. I was really happy. I see all of that in front of my eyes. I could see everything. I could see like when I feel, I feel happy and and like if you come back outside and your mom's cooking perfect food and you have all your friends and a beautiful house and a car, all this dream, but in a different way. I was still dreaming that someone was stupid and say, Umar, it's exactly when you had the best dream and someone wake you up. Or when you sleeping very well and someone wake you up. You hate me. I was in the middle of the love and the dream and everything. Omar, try to do not answer because I'm gonna give a really aggressive answer at that time. So don't answer. This bad person, Omar. And the heart like gets harder. Omar. Then 
they say, what? I thought it was my best friend, who I loved very much. His name was Yusuf. And Yusuf was standing here like a, like a little boy. Hey, Omar. I'm sorry. First time in many years I see so much food. I could not prepare myself, so I eat your food. I'm sorry. Just looking at him. I could not understand. Everything. A second. Everything. My dreams, my food, my life. That food was my family, my happiness, my paradise, everything. I just lost everything. And I was hungry. Really hungry. I want to eat. Anything. Just want to eat. I'm gonna die. I had an extra starvation on other people because saving because of saving this food a long time. I just sit down crying until someone come and say, Umar, take it, some food. I get some food of my friend. And other friend came, Umar, some food from me. And some food and some water and some water. I could eat that day. But my brain was not eating. I was thinking about my food and my everything I could live in a long time. I wanted back. I was thinking the whole time, praying to God, saying I want my food back. At that night, I could not sleep. Absolutely not. Just crying and crying and crying and having horrible ideas in my, my head. I made Kubla, I made something. I, I can't, I can't still think about that. He just, he knew that he killed me by doing that. Why he do? Why he does that? It feels like, I can't understand. The next morning, the gods come and say, you have punishment today. Put someone of you in the middle of the room. When you put someone in the middle of the room, it's the person who's gonna be killed. They killed this person. In our room, no one wanna be back to the middle of the room. No one wanna die. I want to die, but in a different way. Not like that. I wanna die in an easy way. Just go to paradise without having pain again and again. So no one is gonna go back and it was all facing the wall exactly. You can't see the God. I never see God in three years. Always blindfolded or you have the God. It was like facing the wall like that, not seeing. I could hear some movement. Someone was moving back when the God started opening the door. The problem is, if you no know one go back, they may kill 10, 20, 30. So someone should go back to save other people's life. I hear some movement, some one of us want to be volunteered to die to save other people's life. The security opened the door, we're facing the wall, they killed this person. They tortured him very much in his face. So when we turned back, tried to see him, we could not recognize this person. So he was forced to count the rest of the people to know who is missing. At that time, 
One person came to me and said, Umar, it's Yusuf. He sacrificed himself for you so you can eat his food today. He could not bear himself yesterday to eat your food and he is really sorry for doing that and he wish you good luck with this food. Eat. I looked at him, he was still alive, but almost dead. It's easier to be dead. He got the food, and I get food for two people, mine and Yusuf's. I tried to eat his food. Could not. I felt like I was a criminal. If I'm gonna eat his food. It was not really easy for him to see food after years of hunger and starvation. So he wasn't kind of forced to eat that. And maybe I could do the same thing to myself, just food on the floor in time of need. I could not understand how good it was that Yusuf sacrificed himself or how bad it is. But someone came to me and said, if Yusuf did not eat your food yesterday, that's me. Yusuf is not going to go back to the middle of the room to die to save the life of 35 people. So by your food and he get back, we saved life of 35 people in prison. And that's amazing for us as prisoners. We all wish that he never did, never died. But because of Yusuf, I am still alive today. That's why I am here. Because he died, sacrificed himself. That's why I am alive. To make it more clear, a life in prison looks like that. You have your square and you have four hours to sleep. And you don't have that. You sleep like that for four hours. The guards come in the morning, four or five in the morning, and say, how many dead bodies you have? And the answer used to be five, six, seven, eight. Every room answer with number of dead bodies. So after that, four hours of sleep, four hours of torture, when they take out the dead bodies, and when the food comes, because when the food comes, you have torture as well. Then you have 14 hours to sit down and stand up. Nothing else. And all people, it's just silent. No one talk, because to talk means that you're gonna die. They kill you. After three years, which is a long time, all people who was arrested me died. All people I was with and sad died. I was transferred to ten different prisons. All people I met died. The last prison, all people who was transferred with me from the first prison died. The reason why I survived was useless. Not only one Yusuf, not a Yusuf. People who died to save other people's life. Which is not really easy to understand now, but they did. I was sitting next to an old man, and he whispered and told me that he has six daughters. No sons, only daughters. And he told me how much he loved them. And this man used to give me half his water, half the glass, which is a lot of water in prison. And I used to have this half glass water, so half glass and half every day. So I drink mine, and he gets his glass, he drink half, and when he's drinking, my eyes just looking at the water going down, down, like, yeah, the water is going in his mouth, then I get the water. 
handle the water. I want us to really help me. You get this gift every day because you need it. And it's amazing when someone wants to give you something good. I used to get this water, but one day we had no water. And people was really thirsty, they need to drink, and people die if we get like one day without water we die because all our bodies was really sick and really skinny, 75 or 70 pounds. All these people in prison because of torture, hunger. So one day without water, the day after, sure, you're not gonna give me the half a glass because you're gonna die. So I drank mine very slowly because I wanna have the happiness of having water. So I just drink very slowly, look at the water. It's not the water, it's not really good. At that time, even we get the water with blood every day. The same thing with the food. Drank my water and he got his and he started drinking. And I could not control my eyes. Just my eyes going and looking at his water. That was just like going. And I can't survive without this handy glass water from him. I used to that. I saw the water just going and just going and just want to force myself to not watch. And I was dying. And I said, oh, what? It's your water. <laughs> you know, I got this water again, like half a glass. I was really happy. I like, could not understand how amazing it was to take this water and drink. I'm really happy. I want to sleep with that, have amazing dreams. And now when someone knocked my shoulder again, this shoulder, everyone was knocking this shoulder the whole time. Someone looked my shoulder and said, Omar, stupid. He died. Because you drank his water, he died. This man sacrificed himself and his family to keep me alive. That's why I'm still alive. After three years, the God came to call me, took me out. To another room for two days, 48 hours. We had no watch. We was naked in three years. The ceiling, the ground, the walls, and naked people, nothing else. They put me in a room alone and asked me questions. Question every hour because I knew that this was like hour because the watch from the guards beep 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 every hour they could not that could not sleep because they were coming every hour asking me how do you want us to kill you which way and be creative give us good answers it was easy to answer the first 20 times say yeah kill me in this way and not kill me shoot me in this way or kill me this way and this way but like it's harder <laughs> to find answers and when I came to, to 40 answers, I was like done. I didn't have any more words, ways, like it was to find all the horrible ways. I gave 68 answers in 48 times because some answers was boring for this guard. They had fun and funny time when they were torturing us and asking this question. They took me outside to kill me. All the guards is talking about how to kill me. Everyone say, we shoot him. Now we, should, we just hang him. And now we kill him this way and this way. We slap your hand. They put me in the street. It's the last seconds of my life. The same theater at the same day of demonstration. An officer is standing in front of many of soldiers. They put me in the street, my head in the ground. And the officer says, Load. Hey. I was not seeing that. You could imagine everything. Very clear. 
behind me. Aim. Shoot. I really, really died that day. And I had a feeling and faith the rest of the life. So I was sure I'm going to paradise. From death to paradise, I shoot me. I felt that I was on my gate to paradise. So I felt good. There was no pain. They shoot me, no pain because I died. Has anyone here died before? Now the feeling of being dead? No one. So I was dying. And my brain was dying, like done. Now on the next life. Then I wake up after a long time. My body, I get like pain in my butt, so I move. And you know, I get some light inside. It also was under the ground in three years. I get some light from paradise where heavy people is. Try to open my eyes. And I really remember what I saw. Believe me, paradise is beautiful. I saw a tree for the first time in three years. And some stones for the first time after three years. And a bird for the first time after three years. And colors for the first time after three years. And a body with a lot of torture marks. This body can't be in paradise. I'm still alive in the first life. And they didn't kill me, they didn't chew because someone paid a lot of money to get me out of prison. So you could call my mother and say, I have your son. If you pay $20,000, you get your son. So my mom loved me and sent me to Europe to get treatment, medical help, because they had TBC and it was as Bridget was, 75 pounds. Experience to be in prison is hard, it's difficult, it's painful. But it's the best education you can get. The square and the walls is people around you. This person, prisoner, all of them is prisoners. This person is a psychologist. This person is a doctor, and this person is an engineer, and the person behind me is a lawyer. When, you, when we knew that we could whisper in silence, we start to share our knowledge. The psychologist was talking about how to try to be happy when they torture you, the doctor how to take care of your wounds, the engineer how to rebuild the prison, the lawyer how to have a dictator for a prison, I learned everything about how to survive in prison and I knew that the best thing we had in prison was four hours of torture, but the best, I'm very sure, not crazy. The only place we had some space to move our bodies was when they tortured us. If you sit down in three years without movement, you're gonna die. You're gonna die in two months. But if you move, when they hit you, and they put you in the, wall, in the, in the ground, torture you, you move your body, it's important. It's like the same reason why you, you go to some training to have a good body, the same thing in prison. So the best thing we get was torture, to have some movement. And so the people around me to learn. In my way to meet my mother, the police asked me for an ID. I had no ID. What's your name? Omar. They took me, started to kill me with stones. Took stones, hit me in my head. I was coughing blood. 
because of my sickness. But the God who saw the blood in my hand was killing me. He saw the blood and said, why do you have blood before I hit you? I said, it's too close. And this sickness moved forward. If you're going to get this bacteria, I'm going to die together. <laughs> I'm used to that. I don't care. Do not. We're going to die together. This person, like him, like yellow in his face. What? Put this thing outside. Just leave him. Let him go to Turkey. Because if to be safe, I survived. If I never been in prison, I will die with my father and my brothers who were killed and massacred in my village while I was in prison. If I never been in prison, never had the sickness to be safe, never survived in my way to my mother. Could they kill me? They were scared from the blood. If I never had to be safe, never had the, the reason to travel to Sweden, never had the reason to meet amazing people in the hospital. I met my best friend, my family, my Swedish family right now, who I left there. I met them in the hospital. There is a reason behind everything. And I learned try to turn to turn everything into something good. And you can turn everything to something good. I don't know if you had more experience than being tortured in three years and losing your father and brothers and everything. Everything can be great. Torture hours can be your best hours. Thank you. We should clean everything. We started cleaning. Cleaning means like there is blood on the ceiling, blood here, and we should clean everything. And we got more food than before. And no torture. Like no one died. Like no one, no one died. Like we're weird, no one died. One day, two days, three days, like food, food, we eat, and no blood in the food. Strange, weird for us. When I get out of prison, try to match the date. What day? What days was it when we get more food? It was when 55,000 pictures of dead bodies, dead prisoners get out public and was in the media. I was in the same prison where many of these pictures was taken of dead bodies. These dead bodies was my friends, was my cousins and all the people knew. So when people were talking, media was talking, CNN and PBS New, uh, PBS or every channel, people knew. You're just writing something on social media or talking on TV or anything. That's how ex extremely much, as I used to say in English, maybe wrong, but really much that helps that make the government scurry. Oh, people are talking, maybe they're gonna do something, react, act or something. So we stop torturing people, then we see. The month after was a lot of torture because you were in silence, no one is talking. You was talking about these pictures in one month. 
I didn't get more torture because it was in silence. So it's good to talk. Well, my wife, thank you so much. That was incredible, incredibly powerful. And my wife, I was wondering if you could talk to us about those pictures, about those 55,000 pictures of how they, they came out of that regime and how it is that they came to uh, the public's attention. Um, so, the pictures that he's talking about, the 55,000 photographs, were taken by a regime photographer. So this guy has always worked for the Assad regime in the military. He was actually a military policeman who was a forensic photographer. So if any of you have ever seen like CSI or whatever, you know when there's a crime scene, there's a photographer, a forensic photographer, he goes, he takes like photos of the scene, he submits it for you know, law enforcement and others as they're investigating what happened. So his job was if there was a car accident or a fire or a suicide or a flood or whatever, he would go to the scene and take photos. He was specifically supposed to take pictures of any incidents or accidents uh, or incidents of death that happened under the auspices of the Ministry of Defense in Syria. But when the revolution began, and we were talking about the, the kids in Dara that went out and, 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 and were asking for freedom and so on, people were being arrested. You know, when I said they were being met by unlawful arrests into dungeons, they were being arrested as peaceful protesters, and they were being tortured to death, and they were dying in these intelligence branches, they were dying in these prisons where Omar was. And so in the first month of the revolution, this forensic photographer was supposed to go take pictures of 15 incidents of death. They told him there was 15 heart attacks, go take photos. When he got there, he was in a military hospital, and he saw bodies that looked horribly tortured, that he perceived were civilians, um, that had numbers written on them, reminiscent of the numbering that happened in the Holocaust or other horrible never again moments in history. And, and so he quickly went home, told a relative of his that, look, this guy isn't with the opposition, he's not with the government. He's neutral, he's not very highly educated, but very intelligent, humble, simple, wonderful man. He wanted nothing to do with it. He didn't even want to take the photos. He told a relative of his, look, we need to, I, I want to get out of here, help me get out. And, and his relative talked to people within the opposition uh, and, and said, you know, this is the story, can you help this guy get out? And the response was, happy to help you get out, but would you stay? He was documenting upon the orders of the regime what the regime was doing to people like Omar. Omar, by the way, was numbering the bodies that Caesar was taking photos of. Um, so I, was, I was numbering the bodies because we had an isolation room where we had all the dead bodies. The room smelled more than death, like blood being there for, for for years, smell horrible. So the guard don't want to come into this room to write the numbers on the, the on this dead bodies, then carry these dead bodies to the car. So the prisoners get their responsibility. So they forced me to write these numbers on these dead bodies. The first dead body that he wrote the number on was his own cousin, not just any cousin, one that was his best friend before ever getting arrested. Um, so anyway, um, Caesar, and that's not his real name, we codenamed him Caesar for his own protection, but Caesar um, ended up staying for two and a half years. And so only in Damascus, it's a snapshot both in terms of time and geography, two and a half years Damascus alone, not all the other horrible places uh, of detentions and concentration camps that Assad runs. He documented almost 55,000 pictures of men, women, children, and elderly, Christians and Muslims, Sunnis and Shiites and Alawites and Kurds and Arabs, the whole beautiful mosaic of the Syrian people, tortured to death in some of the most horrendous and ways. That as well. That's right, Assad holds more American citizens, by the way, than any terrorist group or foreign government ever. You all should be outraged because they're being treated just like he is. And if we don't care about other human beings, we should care about our own. But that being said, um, when I first received those 55,000 photos, we were just disillusioned with the government and the world and what could happen. And, and it was the first time um, that I had ever walked into the U.S. Holocaust uh, Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. And I had the hard drive and, and stuff. And I said, look, I don't even know 
what to do. Can you please help us like memorialize these people just archived in history? I don't even know their names, we just had numbers and faces. Um, and so the Holocaust Museum since then has been a public partner of the, of the Syrian Emergency Task Force. Those photos are, some of them are on display at an at a exhibit at the Holocaust Museum since 2014. If any of you visits Washington, please go uh, and, and look at those photographs. Uh, look at the evidence of, of the stories that, that Omar just told you. The question was, what, when we think that the, the war can end soon, we can return back to our countries. First, I love my country. I love Syria very much. I grew up there, I have a lot of memories, and it was a beautiful country, beautiful village. We had the ocean, and the mountains, and the river, and the lake, everything, and the birds, and everything. They destroyed a lot, but still beautiful in my eyes. And I, I believe that we're gonna return back to our country. But I still don't think it's gonna be very, very soon. It's gonna take some time. So, inshallah, we are, you get to go home. Um, and all the series go. But it takes the rest of the world to do more. And so it takes regular people, When the American people move their government, then we all go home. Not me, I'm American, I'm staying, but you all go home. Okay. We go back to station. <laughs> Being released in Syria, at a very hard way to Turkey. Come to Turkey. Gonna meet my mother who was living there. Moved after the massacres when they killed my father and other brothers. So she moved with the rest of my siblings. And they come to Turkey. So I should travel to my mother to help her recognize me that it's Omar should she pay money to the lawyer or get me outside of prison because my mother saw me in the sky and said nah, it's not my son I was skinny I was not really handsome as I was before they come to Turkey I met my mother and fortunately my mother could not recognize me so the security in Turkey and the the doctor took me to an isolation room because they had no right to be in the hospital because they had no ID. So I was in an isolation room in Turkey one month. I felt better, but then I started, started to feel bad and start to die. And my mother said, start to recognize me that she was not allowed to visit me because they had TBC and no one should get this sickness. And she decided to send me to Greece. So I was with my 10 years old brother who survived the war and the massacres, he came to me and knocked my door and said, Omar, let's go to Europe. Like 10 years old brother. This guy, let's go to Europe. Really tough man, trying to show me he's very strong. He had the responsibility when I was in prison for everything. To try to make, we're not friends, but follow me to Europe. <laughs> like, oh, hard man. I was following him, like I had nothing else to do. I said, Mom, my mom should send me, follow me. I was following him, I was communicating with smugglers, with everything. It feels like he's 35 years old. Came to the boat, and we will sit in this boat seven, seven, eight hours in the boat from Turkey to Greece. 
As I said before, all people in this, in this belt is crying because people die in the way from Turkish grace. No one help. No one help. Yeah, it was a lot of people at that time. Yeah, so I was thinking this about people's crying. Two people was not crying. My own brother, because he want to show me that he's strong. And me, because it was the first time I see so much water. I could shower. <laughs> like, more than one glass, like shower, really shower. So I was laughing, happy, trying to make a joke. People are confused. Some people, when it just hit me, shut up! What are you doing? Cry! All people are crying, you're laughing. So you don't understand. You're not gonna understand me. So we come to Grace. Ten meters before we come to land, the boat destroyed, and we pulled all the wood. And then the water, a lot of children, a lot of pregnant women, trying to get these people to land, and we could. Come to Greece. I think that I came to paradise. But the first one I met was a Buddhist who said something in English. I could not speak English for three years ago. So he's trying to say something. No, no. I could not understand. I could say no. He said, You pay, you come in. You don't pay, swim back. We pay, man. So pay money, get into the boat, they understand. I had no idea what Europe is, like you didn't know what refugees means. Because it was in prison before refugees, like, that this Christ happened. I was in prison very early. So I come to Greece, just sent me to Macedonia and Serbia, Serbia, Croatia, and Austria. And Austria said, you should go to hospital, you're dying, man. Yeah, I'm dying. No one care, man. I'm tired. Took me to the hospital and the Red Cross said you should go to Germany, it's better. Come to Germany. You know what they said in Germany? The first person who met me in a camp for refugees. Take off your clothes. I look at him. You know what? He had a translator. I was naked in three years, man. I can't do it here. I'm not gonna do it. I was like in three years. Is it Sainaya too? He said, you should do it. No, get back. So I take my younger brother, get out, sleep, to sleep outside in the street two days. I'm talking about December. Really cold weather. Sleep in the street, we use, you know, we fix it. Then we come to Copenhagen, Denmark. I thought they're gonna help me, like you know, Scandinavian people, beautiful. <laughs> and you come there, no one cares, man. There is 200,000 refugees. You are no one here, no one cares about you. You come to Sweden, and people in Sweden, when I saw I had TBC, everyone gets scared. Oh, TBC, take them to the hospital. So you took them to the hospital. And people in Sweden, in the South Sweden, not now, they speak like that. Well, in this case, oh, let's talk a little bit now. It's not called Svenskland, it's not called Svenskland, it's not called Svenskland. I say, they're gonna say Omar, they say, Elmo. <laughs> the nurse was saying my name to come to the doctor. Like, say Elmo, I was not looking at anyone, just not my name. She goes, because no one else here, it's only me. I say Elmo, 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 are you Omar? Omar? Yes, yes, come, come. I met the doctor. was horrible introduction to the Swedish society. But then I, they moved to Stockholm to have better treatment. And I stopped learning Swedish in the hospital. And learned Swedish, then learned Norwegian, then started with English. And only for the last five months has he been speaking English. He also finished high school, which he didn't finish in Syria, in eight months in Sweden. So, he's incredibly talented. But... More questions. Hi, so um, can you 
can you talk a little bit more about how exactly you kept going when you were in there, uh, despite seeing all these people, your friends, people around you? I mean, there has to be a level of like desensitization, but like, what kept you to, to stay alive? How did you keep track of time when you were there? There is something that helped me to still alive, to survive. First, people around me giving me some food, giving me some water. And our way to the toilet was 35 meters of torture, guards to the right, to the left. When I was going and the heart is hitting me, two of my friends, prisoners, used to go next to me and have their bodies over my body. So they protect me, they get torture. I can turn it without torture. I was one of the few people who get this protection of people who is ready to die to give you life. The other thing is to have faith. You can say hope if you want. I always had faith. With every single bat I get in my back, for every bat I'm gonna get reward in the future in my paradise. So I used to be happy when they torture me more than yesterday. Because in this case, I'm gonna have more rewards in my paradise, my afterlife. And your body as a human adopts everything, especially when you're young. You used to pain. And your body don't feel that anymore. The same thing sometimes with starvation and like that and the most important thing was I forgot my family when I was in prison because they arrested a new cousin and before he died he told me Omar they killed your father then he told me that Omar they killed your oldest brother then your other brother then he said they killed they killed all your family the entire family and all your short childhood friends, they killed everyone. You don't have anyone outside, and your cousin died inside, and the only one you have, and he died. I had no one to think about. The only one I could think about, my soul, take care about me. He had no idea, no thought about going outside of prison. But I want to survive to have long time, long life in prison. It was a good reason to survive. To people, forget your family, take care of your throat. Have faith. Um, and, and just quickly mentioned that he was told everyone was killed. His, the, the, the massacre that happened in Omar's village is one of the most notorious of the Syrian war. Um, even this, if, even if I was to describe the way they slaughtered men, women, and children, it would be too much. Just in terms of it. it's all documented. I mean, Omar has a video of his own father being murdered in the worst place. But um, any other question? I started to write my book three times, and every time I write the first five, 50 page, then I said, no, it's bad, write it again. I don't like to write with my fingers. I want someone else to write. I could not find this person yet. Anna, how are you doing? I think I almost found her. The other thing that this experience can traumatize some people, make it difficult and I absolutely got and get nightmares absolutely and that nightmares was really difficult in the beginning when you're sleeping and 
a lot of police is just running by the village, really running like faster than Ferrari. Just boom, no one can get out. I will see this time trying, 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 trying. You wake up. The good feeling that you miss, the good feeling that exactly the same feeling when you feel released. Feeling of like seeing that tree, the birds, the life. You get that good feeling every day. That extra thing you should know. When I wake up in my room, I have two pictures. The first thing I see when I wake up, two pictures of two gods who was torturing me in prison. These two guys, it's really important to me. One of them was torturing me in 10 months, one of them was torturing me one year, nine months. I wake up every day when I don't want to go to work because I'm tired, I want to sleep more. Look at them. This two guys was trying to kill me in three years, and I survived. It's too easy to go to work now. <laughs> Come back from work, very tired. Go to my room. Oh, hey! You see the same guy there. Tired? I survived to be tired and tortured in three years. It's easy. Just sleep. See them in the dream, you know, you won the war before. So I was the winner of this conflict and then they, they wanna break my heart and my feelings and my smile. But I still have my smile after three years of torture. I have it. So I won this war. She has an incredible story. She should learn English first before being a speaker. But she feels very good. Strong mother. Moved to Sweden six months ago. The first meeting after six years when he started to recognize me. It was so beautiful and hard to meet her in the airport in Sweden. She feels really good and sex of yeah, six. Six of my siblings survived and two died, and my father died. So my mother and six siblings, we were a big family. Mm -hmm. um, the, the horrible massacre in that, yes, spared no one, including unborn children. Um, but his mom, because she was a businesswoman and a merchant, she knew the roots and would go to Turkey and stuff, actually was able to not only get away, but, but save those that were able to survive that. So we have time for one last question. Thank you very much for your stories and uh, your enthusiasm and your giving us the, the hope just from your presence here. So uh, it's really been an incredible experience. I have a question for um, any or all of you. Um, you mentioned the need for attention um, and uh, the art, or for our attention to stay on the issue. And so uh, from your perspective right now with the work you're doing, how much attention is the issue getting? And uh, what can an audience like this do to use uh, it or keep it? Well, I think the attention comes in waves. Um, it's not nearly enough as it should be. And I think as an audience member, I can really speak to this because I'm not a Syrian American. I didn't grow up in Syria. I went to school here two years ago. I sat in the seats and I just read about this conflict. And I was moved by this conflict. And you hear these stories and it's so overwhelming and it's heartbreaking and it's really hard to process it all and it's really easy to just look away to go back to your life in the wonderful main line and, but these people are suffering there are still thousands of people who are in Sedan there's still thousands of prisoners there's still children raining chemical weapons on them this week people are being murdered and slaughtered this week and we can't we can't look away Eight years later, we've come eight years and this is still a problem. So we can get involved. Like Omar said, when there's a tension, things get better. So call your members of Congress. We can write letters of hope. The, just the kids knowing that there's, they have a friend in the United States who's looking out for them, 
means the world to them. It gives them the power to go just another day like Omar did. Um, tomorrow at noon, we have a vigil at Love Park in honor of detainees in Syria. There is an American family we've been working with, Maj Kamamaz. He's a 61-year-old humanitarian therapist, um, has been held in these same prisons for two years. So we're gonna go in support of his family and in support of detainees. And we're also gonna go in honor of the 49 people who lost their lives to a terrorist attack yesterday in New Zealand. Um, and then just get involved with the Syrian Emergency Task Force. There's always ways to help and we would love all of your support. Thank you all so much. Thank you for coming. Really Harrison High School and the administration here who made this not possible, and the WIA officers for doing so much to help, and of course, Omar Mawaz and Anna for coming. Can we give them one last? Also, um, we are selling Soup for Syria books outside. The All proceeds go towards SETF and supporting these causes. Um, it's filled with recipes from tons of different, oh, from my sister Bridget's holding up a book. Wore it on cue, so you can buy the book and come talk to us if you're interested in getting involved. Thank you, Thank you guys so much for coming.